New Hope Outreach Ministries, making a difference by taking the gospel from word to action. And now, today's message. Amen. Amen. Um, I have a word today from the Lord. I was uh, pondering it so much, I changed it five different times last night and laying in the bed and woke up again. And the Lord was giving me more stuff to put in here. And so uh, what he was talking to us about, what he's telling us today, and especially welcome those that are watching or viewing uh, live stream. Uh, we're glad that you're watching. Uh, he says, get up and press on in Christ. Uh, in this day and age, many of us are being canceled and knocked down from positions that we may have had at one time. And now the world looks at it and says, well, we're just going to cancel you uh, for whatever the reason may be. And so people are left on the sidelines. But for Christians, <clears throat> God is telling you, you're my child. When you get knocked down in this world, get up and press on in Christ. Let's pray. Father. We're so grateful that you have provided a way of escape. And thank you so much that it was provided by the only living God, Jesus, the Christ of God, that we may have victory forever in all things covered by the blood. As we sang and talked about today, bless you for being the only God that truly cares about us at all times and makes a way for us in you. Thank you for those that are not here. We pray, Father, you're, you are with them. We thank you for the pastors that are visiting. I pray they be refreshed and have a great time of uh, vacationing and, and being where they need to be at this time. But they're never out of you and never away from us. Our hearts go out to them and with them. We bless you now, Lord God, as you have made this one family, one body, one church. I pray also we have one mind that you are our Lord and God in Jesus name. Amen. I'm going to use a couple of examples of people in the Bible, and we're going to move kind of quickly. Peter is the first one. He was the outspoken and undeniable leader of the 12 disciples. Is that right? Yet he denied Christ the night of Christ's interrogation and eventual crucifixion by Pilate. And he went out and wept bitterly. Peter's mindset, I believe, was saying to himself he was no longer worthy of being the leader or even a disciple of the one that he had openly denied. That he had even knew the man called Christ. What, what a powerful dichotomy, because if we look real close at Matthew 16, 16, just a part of it, if we look at it, there was a change of heart for Peter in this dichotomy. Listen, listen to what it says. It says Peter was asked uh, who do men say that I am? And Peter jumped up and said, thou art the Christ. <laughs> the son of the living God. But in Matthew 26, 74, <laughs> then began he, this is Peter, to curse and to swear, saying, I know not the man. Paul also was persecuted. He, he persecuted the church. He watched them stone people, he imprisoned people, and even watched them get murdered, believers of those now of the way. He went ransacking and removing believers from their homes. And for, the, and for these constructive works of his religious mindset, he was knocked off his high horse of his religious persecution of Christ through his persecuting the believers in Christ and his church. Paul was blinded for three full days. Now, both Paul and Peter were in a fallen state. One was groveling on the ground, weeping bitterly for denying Christ, and the other was knocked off his high horse of religious persecution. He was a Pharisee of Pharisees. Knocked to the ground, and he was blinded, meaning Paul, and now needing someone to lead him by the hand. But let me, let's, let me remind you of one thing certain. I, I believe this is what God wants us to know. One thing for certain, we know that both men got up and became leaders in the church and the body of Christ. 
Paul received his physical and spiritual sight to become the apostle of the Gentiles and the author of, of close to one half of the New Testament. Peter also got up from his weeping. As scripture says, the angel at the tomb where Christ at Christ's tomb told the women who were there to anoint him in the burial and burial. But go your way. Tell his disciples and Peter. That he meaning Christ goeth forth or goeth before you in Galilee. There shall ye see him. As he said unto you, that was Mark 16 and verse seven. Christ had prophesied. To Peter, Satan, Satan hath desired to have you, that he may sift you like wheat. But I have prayed for you that your faith fail not. That's Luke 22, 31 and 32. We need to understand that it is Satan's desire, his dream, to sift every born again believer that calls upon the name of the Lord. Like we, what does John 10, 10 tell us? The thief. Now hear this. That particular scripture is talking about a hireling, someone that is watching over a shepherd or sheep. And as we would look at that as a shepherd, a pastor or so forth, someone that would be inside the church realm. The thief cometh not but for to steal, to kill and to destroy. This is Satan's heart's desire. For every one of the born again believers in Christ. To rip and to tear their faith, to tear their families, to tear their lives and their hopes to shreds. Leaving them in hapless, hopeless and helpless situations, groping in the darkness as he desired to do with Peter. Peter was an example. But remember, the second portion of that scripture says this, but I am come. That they may have life and that they may have it more abundantly. The word says that Jesus intervened on Peter's behalf. Jesus said to Simon, Peter, I pray for you that your faith fail not. In the midst of being cast down, thrown down, torn down, canceled in this society, as a born again believer in Christ, remember Christ has prayed for Peter and he is not a respecter of person. So he is praying for you. That your faith in him will not fail. Amen. Romans tells us in, in the eighth chapter in verse 34 exactly what I just said. Who is he that condemneth? It is Christ that died. Yea, rather that is risen again who is even at the right hand of God, which is the position of authority, who also maketh intercession for us. Peter got up and after being filled with the Holy Spirit, boldly said to the other apostles when the council set against them, demanded them no longer to teach in the name of Jesus. This is what Peter said. He was no longer bitterly weeping that he had denied Christ. He was now filled with the spirit of God. And this is what he said. We ought to obey God rather than men. And he also proclaimed that the name of Jesus is the only name whereby men should be saved. Peter got up and being filled with the spirit proclaimed the power and presence of Christ to heal and to restore resides in him. Help Holy Ghost. There's a message there. When you are sitting, mm, help Holy Ghost. When you are torn and thrown down, cast out, canceled. As a born again believer in Jesus Christ. The power to heal yourself resides in you. The restoration power of the Holy Spirit is in you. Peter said this, silver and gold have I none, but such as I have. I taught, we preached, taught about that a couple weeks ago. 
but such as I have, give I thee in the name of Jesus Christ of Nazareth. You know, the one I once denied that I even knew him. Rise up and walk. In the midst of being cast down, torn down, thrown down, canceled. The spirit of the Lord within the born again believer is saying, rise up and walk. Walk in and with me. This walk in life of faith that we have in Christ is one of an eternal, victorious life relationship with God. I'll say that again. This walk in life of faith we have in Christ is one of an eternal, victorious life relationship with God. Not one that is torn apart but one that is being restored and in the restoration process makes you victorious in life and in relationships. Help Holy Ghost. We win because he won the victory at the cross. And with his bodily resurrection, we too are made alive in victory in him by his spirit. But what happens when we get knocked down in life? It may even deny that we are even associated with Christ because we don't want people to know that we're with Christ because people talk. And, you know, if you say the wrong thing too, ooh, don't, I'm not going to say it. Nope. Anyway, people talk. <laughs> but what happens when you get knocked down? Like Peter and Paul both were knocked down. Just, just, just as Christ got up in victory over all the power of the grave and Peter and Paul forsook all in pursuit of Christ, we are to also get up and press on in Christ by the same power and spirit that raised Jesus from the dead. It also dwells within us in victory. He's not just dormant. He is in victory in us. The victory is in us. It's not dormant. It's alive. The spirit quickens, makes alive. So when we get knocked down, torn down, thrown down, canceled in this society and everywhere else, we're not in God like that, we are restored and victorious. Being justified in Christ, we get up. We dust off ourselves and move forward, not haphazardly, but boldly in Christ. We get up like Peter and Paul did and press on in Christ. I love hearing the word covenant. We were speaking it earlier. Every time I hear covenant now, there's a bunch of words that I'll be listening for now around us in, individually and, and as a group of folks. I love to hear that word because I want to know, is everybody on t in tune with that word? Covenant. That word keeps coming up. When it comes up, you know what happens that should happen on the inside of us? We get excited. Why? Because we're in the New Testament of the covenant of his blood. And it has better promises that we are, we are now heirs because of what Christ did and because we're in him. We are in him. That's where our covenant is. It's found in him. So whenever we get knocked down, torn down, thrown down, and canceled, guess what? You still have the covenant of God living within you, alive, victoriously, shouting, get up. You have been made a king and a prince and a, a priest, I'm sorry, in this world, in this day, for his glory and for our benefit. For a just man, we've been made justified through Christ. For a just man falleth. Seven times. Anybody hear that except me? A just man, a man of God, a, a woman of God falls seven times. This is what the word says. But what does it say after that? 
I believe, thank you, Holy Spirit. I believe sometimes we believe that the position that we end up in, like Peter, when he fell, he was bitterly weeping. That is how we should remind ourselves of who Peter was or is. So that when we also fall, well, Peter fell, so we should be in the same mindset and just stay right there. That's not what the word teaches us. And that's not what Christ died for. He died that we may live and have life more abundantly. He's the good shepherd. Remember that hireling, he's not the good shepherd. He don't care. He hopes you get rent, torn, tear, and he could care less. But our God, through Christ, cares for us so much he put a covenant in blood to make sure nothing else could taint that relationship ever again. And we can stand up and get up and move forward in him. Bless the name of the Lord. For a just man falleth seven times and rises up again. Why? Because what's in him is life. He's been justified by God through the life of Jesus Christ. And we are in him. So we too are alive. Help Holy Ghost. But the wicked shall cancel you, knock you down, throw you down, and tell you you are no longer worthy of anything. But guess what? They shall fall into mischief. When we're knocked down in life, get up and continue to run with patience the race set before us. Hebrews 12, verse 1. Because Christ got up victorious over all the power of the enemy. The enemy's power was in sin, death, hell, and the grave. We too are victorious over the same. So we can get up and press on in Christ. Know ye not that they which run in a race run all, but one receiveth the prize. So run that you may obtain. That's 1 Corinthians 9, 24. This scripture by Paul, who's that writing this again now? This is the one that was on his high horse of religious persecution, persecuting the church. Got knocked off that, that perch, if you will. Blinded, now needing someone to show him the way. Help, Holy Ghost. Paul is saying for born-again believers in Christ to continue to race, to run the race, sorry, in the life and love of God through Christ. And know that you are victorious. Because he made you the righteousness of God in Christ. I believe that's 2 Corinthians 7, 5, 17 through 21. You cannot lose. Help Holy Ghost. I, I believe sometimes that when I get knocked, I'm, I'm going to use me so y'all don't have to feel like you know, anything else other than just take a look up. I feel sometimes when I get knocked down, I can't get up. I'm overwhelmed. The, the things that have happened to me are just too great. There's no way for it to happen to be restored. I mean, good gracious, look what happened. There's just absolutely no way for me to ever get up from this position in this situation. Let's cash in the chips. There's nothing else to do except go away from it or, or just stay down. What a sad testimony for a born-again believer of God with the spirit of God alive in him or her. The one that had victory and gave it to us over sin and its penalty and judgment, over death, hell, and the grave. You're no longer going to see it except these vessels going back into the ground. He was the, first, he was the firstborn of, the, of many brethren through his resurrection power and life. We're the brethren that's following in that life, so there's no reason for us to stay in that mindset or position. Yeah, but you know what I did do, Brother, brother Fred. I mean, good gracious. And how can I ever look up or, you see, because, mm, help Holy Ghost, that's later. I'm going to keep rolling. Help Holy Ghost. Paul is saying, being born again, believers in Christ, to continue it, to run the race. In, this, in the life and love of God through Christ and know that you are victorious because he made you the righteousness of God in Christ. You cannot lose. 
So when you're knocked down in life and or living, your mindset should already tell you, get up! Because Christ rose and press on in Christ. For we win because he won for us. One of the problems that we have is this. We cannot forget the past, whether it was the recent past or the long longevity of the past. Whatever time frame it is, we cannot forget the past and press forward in Christ. Why? Look, Paul, whose past was talked about, we talked about, sorry about that, was very violent and destructive. Very violent and very destructive. He stood by and watched them stone Stephen, holding their coats while watching over their coats. But they have consequences to others. He inflicted his religious fervor upon. Look what it says in Philippians 3, 13 and 14. This is the same guy. This is the same guy that had religion as his God, Judaism, Judaism persecuting the church, those of the way. Listen to what he says now to the church at Philippi. Brethren, <laughs> you know, the ones I was bumping upside the head and making sure they, their houses were ransacked, ransacked, torn apart and drawn and taken to prison. Brethren, I count not myself to have apprehended, but this one thing I do, forgetting those things which are behind. You know what happens? People don't let you forget those things, Brother Ernest. Huh? You, you may even get to the point where, okay, I can forget it. All right, I know what I did, et cetera, to someone or whatever it may be. But people are not going to let you forget that. You know what you did. As a matter of fact, let me, let me pull up what, what, what does uh, Sister Daphne say about these, why we have these smartphones is about Christ and so forth and not that other stuff. Well, the other stuff is always those folks that are going to come to your household or will call you or have your name out on their Facebook, et cetera, saying, are you listening to me? Okay. Paul, who was one of those folks. Brethren, I count not myself to have apprehended, but this one thing I do, forgetting those things which are behind and reaching forth unto those things which are before. Why? Because Christ is now bearing the penalty and the judgment. Can we give our brothers and sisters grace so that that penalty and judgment which Christ bore with his life and his blood that we can now have? So do these people that Paul, the persecutor, is now calling brethren. How come we, in this day and age, have problems with that? Giving grace to our brothers and sisters so that they can live the same victorious life that we want to live. Because heaven forbid if it was reversed. Help Holy Ghost. This is why when you have the opportunity, help Holy Ghost to give grace, give it instantly without without any reservation and even regardless of the consequences. Why? Because you're covered in the blood. He will not allow you to be tempted above more than you're able anymore. You are. Fire, help Holy. Mm. I don't want to get on a tangent. Verse 15, let us therefore, as many as be perfect, be thus minded. Help, Holy Ghost. And if in anything ye, are, ye be otherwise minded, God shall reveal even this unto you. Listen, compared to the great life we have in Christ, anybody else think it's a great life that we have in Christ? Anybody? Just me? I believe we have a great life in Christ. Hello? Compared to the great life we have in Christ, all that is in and of the world is counted as dung. Now, this is what Paul was saying. I'm taking that attitude as well, because when you think about all that's in and of this world, it's all going to the drought and it's all being cast into the fire. Why would I give myself to it? It has no hope, no promise. It leads to death. So my mindset is all that stuff that, you know, the ones that are knocking you down, casting you down, throwing you down and canceling you is all going to the drop and into the fire. And we are giving it power, brother Ernest, and it has none. Help, Holy Ghost. 
Yea, doubtless, I count all things but loss for the excellency of the knowledge of Christ Jesus my Lord, for whom I have suffered the loss of all things and do count them but dung that I may win Christ and be found in him. <laughs> That's, <laughs> I hear covenant every time I see that. And be found in him, not having mine own righteousness, making it up as I go along the way I see it, which is of the law, and the law must be paid instantly. And it brings forth death because we cannot cover it. That's why we're covered by the blood. But that which is through the faith of Christ, the righteousness which is of God by faith. I'm going to skip verse 10. Moving on. When you get knocked down, what is it that we're supposed to do? Oh, that was good. I like that. I like that. I didn't think anybody was paying attention except, you know. I'm being, don't, don't worry about me. But then what happens after we get up? We must repent and present. Here's the, here's the one that I know is the hardest for all of us. We can repent. We, we may even get up. But then we're supposed to present ourselves as a living sacrifice unto God. As he gave his life for us, we are to give our lives for him to live his life. And pastor said this through us. Are you listening to me? And here's the final part of that. Don't take it back. Okay, I'm getting up. I'm repenting. I'm giving myself as a I'm giving myself as a living sacrifice unto you, God. But I'm taking it back because there's a there's a tough thing that I'm facing right now. And, and, and I can't allow uh, anything other than what I want to have happen, happen through and in my life. So I'm going to take that back. No, sir, do not take it back. It belongs to God. You are freely, willingly giving your life to him. Verse 12, I beseech you, therefore, brethren, by the mercies of God, that you present your bodies a living sacrifice, holy and acceptable unto God which is your reasonable ser service. It's not, it's not your religion. It's not your works. It's not your church attendance. <laughs> but it's your life given to the one you are eternally in a life covenant relationship with. That's why you give your life up. Because you're in an eternal life covenant or covenant life relationship with God. And be not conformed to this world, but be ye transformed by the renewing of your mind that ye may prove what is that good and acceptable and perfect will of God. Be not conformed to this world means do not take on the spirit and character of the God of this world. And how does it come? Through pride and self. I'm going to go through five things real quick, not real quick, as fast as I can. The main enemy we face in getting up and moving on in Christ is ourselves in pride. I didn't ask uh, Daphne to put this, one up, put this one up, Matthew 16, 24, but I, I think if anyone would follow after Christ, they must first deny themselves. And from that, Number one, pride is your main enemy. Don't you dare. Pride is your main enemy, and deceit is his weapon of choice. You find that depicted in Job 41, 34. As the great unbeatable Leviathan creature, it is the representation of the spirit of pride loosed in this world, loosed in our lives, loosed upon our minds to control and stifle your life in Christ. It says he beholdeth all high things, high minded, puffed up things. He is a king over all the children of pride. Thank God. Pride is not greater than he that is in us. 
Greater is he that is in us than he that is in the world. First John 4, 4. I said that to say it like this. Pride is out and around and always accessible. But it is not greater than who is in you. If we'll take our eyes for just a second and realize that even though it looks good, what did pastor always say? It may be good to you. Uh, how, how, how's it going? Now, now, we've heard that and we hear that and we know that. But pride is saying deceptively, oh, don't worry about that. Go ahead and get in to it. Anyway, are you listening to me? But the greater one on the inside is saying, cast that thing down. I believe it was Daphne again that says 2 Corinthians 10, 10, 5. Casting down imagination to every high thing that exalts itself above the knowledge of God and bringing into captivity every thought to the obedience of Christ. Number two, pride deceives you into choosing to live a self-centered life. Making self-serving decisions and not to live a God-centered and God-purposed life in Christ as Pastor John has been teaching us. I'm saying this all about Christians, born-again believers. This is not for, I mean, you can hear it, but this is not dealing with those outside of the body. I'm talking about what's happening inside the body. Pride is running ruckshod in all too many lives of born-again believers as an accepted practice and way of living as a believer. And God is telling us today, no, 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 get up and move on where? In Christ, not in yourself. Help Holy Ghost. Amen? Deuteronomy 8, 7 gives us a picture of of having pride, living a self-centered and making your own decisions and not living a God-centered and purposed life in Christ. And thou say in thine heart, my power and the might of mine hand have gotten me this wealth. The heart represents your conscience. Now, this is what the dictionary says. It defines it as an inner feeling. You know, we live by our feelings. Is that right as Christians? We live by our feelings, correct? Nobody want to throw at me saying, no, (laughs) no. But this is what it's saying. And, And many people are living by their feelings. An inner feeling or voice, something told me, viewed as acting as a guide to the rightness or wrongness of one's behavior. But this is actually what your heart is. It's where your spirit and your soul are connected. And when you become born again, that consciousness is now no longer the nature of this world, but the nature of God's spirit is what your heart and your soul are now a part of. Is that all right? Going to number three, pride is the destructive, now this is Fred Brooks, pride is the destructive infestation of selfishness, a.k.a. the destroyer, not the builder, not the restorer of all relationships. I'll say it again. Pride is the destructive infestation infestation in other words it's not going to leave it's going to continue to grow and sprout in your life bigger and bigger as long as you allow it to be there of selfishness aka the destroyer not the builder not the restorer of all relationships where'd i get that from pride goeth before destruction Proverbs 16, 18, and a haughty spirit before a fall. I found out that pride, now now this is also very applicable for our lives as men and women born again and helping others. Pride in men in marriage relationships is used to intimidate the strength of a man and then to neglect. I don't have to and I don't want to. Because I'm the man. Are you listening to me? 
That's what's happening in marriages all over this world and especially, sadly to say, in Christians' lives and families and marriages. Now, that's the man's side. Y'all ain't getting away with me. Anyway, pride in women in marriage relationships. Now, hear what I'm saying now. This is not something that's just dormant in, in the marriage. This is actively used. Are you hearing me? It is used to manipulate and emasculate their spouse. The sad truth is that either or both, if one of them's being used or both of them being used by the man and or the woman or just one of them individually, the marriage relationship will be will lead to destruction. Why? Because pride goeth before destruction. If it's happening, if it's there, there's, no, there's only one place for it to go, according to the word of God. And we do believe that the word is true. Is that right? So there's something that has to begin to happen in the relationships. In order for God, that victorious life that we just talked about when we get up and get in Christ to be actually in our lives, in our marriage relationships, in our families, to be passed down to generation. Number four, pride teaches your heart to seek evil and not to seek the Lord and his wisdom. I'll say it again. Pride teaches your heart to seek evil and not to seek the Lord and his wisdom. The heart is deceitful above all all things and desperately wicked who can know it I have an example yeah, second, second Chronicles 12 14 Rehoboam he denied the advice and wisdom of his father's priests and elders you know who his father was right Solomon the wisest man on earth Rehoboam, he chose to follow the evil advice of uninformed, worldly young men. Let me, let, me, let me get something out. It's on my heart. There are young people that get advice from young people because they do not trust the, the advice of older people. Why? Because older people shun them. I, I don't want to say it like, okay, the, the older people shun the younger people uh, because the things that the young people are doing, they don't want to have anything to do with, so therefore they just shun them. No, they're actually looking at the, the situation. I'm talking about born-again believers now. They're looking at the situation, and instead of standing up for what Christ is saying and then loving those young people into a relationship with them and Christ, we're, we're actually saying I, there's nothing I can do about it. Are you hearing what I'm saying? There's a desperation of, for the hearts of young people that want to come out from some of the stuff that they're in the midst of, but the older people that they're, not everyone, of course, that they're looking upon, they shun what they're doing instead of leading them out of darkness into the light of his dear son. Yeah, but you, you got to accept me the way I am. No, I don't have to accept you the way you are. I can accept you what Christ says you are and then love you, but I'm not going to accept the things that you're doing because they're son. Is, is that clear enough for you? Amen. Rehoboam decided not to follow the advice of his uh, father's elders and priests. He chose to follow the evil advice of uninformed, worldly young men, allowing his pride to prevent him from preparing his heart to seek God's wisdom. The verse reads, and he did evil. Now, now I didn't call it evil. This is what the word called what he did evil. He sought not to seek the wisdom of God because that's exactly where Solomon's uh, priests 
and elders were getting their wisdom from. Because he prepared not his heart to seek the Lord. He prepared his heart to seek his own way. Number five, pride is the arbiter of contention. Pride opens the door for contention. I'll just make it as plain as I can with that. The word says only by pride cometh contention, but with the well advised is wisdom. Only by pride means only by pride. Contention will come. It's a it's coming. OK, the word is not telling the truth. The word is true. It's coming. And what is contention all about? Contention brings quarrels. Contention brings debates. Contention brings strife. Only through Christ comes a covenant relationship of life. This is the Lord's doing. It is marvelous in our eyes. That was Psalms 118, 23. Contention, therefore, is the offspring of pride birthing endless quarrels. Useless debates and manifold strifes. Everything is an area of contention when pride is the arbiter thereof. But here's your solutions. I found this out, and I've been trying to put it to practice. You know what? I've been trying to put it to practice quickly. Does, does, does anybody understand? <laughs> you know. <laughs> now, those of you that know how, and, and uh, I'm so grateful for you, that, that have known this and know how, I'm so grateful for you. But you know what? When you have not been practicing what it is that you should be practicing in accordance to the word of God and or for marital uh I guess the word is bliss, but it's never bliss. But uh, marital relationships. You need to begin to get up. And press on. In Christ, in that area, does that make sense? Amen. Peter says it like this. Likewise, ye husbands, first Peter three and seven. Dwell with them according to knowledge. Seek out what it is that makes your wife tick. Husbands, born again, filled with the spirit. <laughs> Amen. According to knowledge, giving honor to the wife as unto the weaker vessel. Don't use your intimidation. Don't neglect over her. It's just another form of, help me, Holy Ghost, of witchcraft, dominating or desiring to do so. And as being heirs together of the grace of life. Make sure you understand she's just as much chi a child of God as you are. Help, Holy Ghost. that your prayers be not hindered. Notice I didn't do anything about what the wives are supposed to do. Gentlemen, we all know that it falls on us as leaders of our households to set the atmosphere, help Holy Ghost, this is pastoral, this is definitely not Fred Brooks, in our household, in our marriage, in our families. Get up, repent, and press on in Christ. How? In humility. That's a tough pill to swallow because pride tells me to keep going the way I'm going because I don't want to say that I was wrong or that I need to do something different. I like the way it is because I'm not, I don't want to be responsible for whatever someone knows. I simply want to keep going forward. 
a person that is born again, filled with the spirit of God, he or she must have humility to get to that position. So the same thing applies to applying these things that I'm saying right now as solutions to the present state of many marriages. First Peter five, six through nine. And I'll close out of this. Peter says, humble yourselves, therefore, under the mighty hand of God. In other words, choose no longer to be your own God, your own decision maker. Prepare your heart. Seek to seek the Lord so that he will give you the guidance and wisdom that you need in order for you to walk your life out in him. And have your spouse with you. All the way that you go. And the only word, oh, help the, the, the furthest you're going to go is how much you are in him. See, if you try to go in your own power and direction, that's as far as you can take it. And it's only, as we said earlier, is going to become destruction. It's not going to be something you can build. It's not a relationship builder. It's a destroyer. That he may exalt you in due time. See, everybody wants praise. Everybody wants to be recognized. But guess what? The only God of creation wants to exalt you. Why? Because he has created you for his own good pleasure. Humble yourselves, therefore, under the mighty hand of God that he may exalt you in due time. Don't look for anybody else's approval except that of God's. God, I'm jacking it up from the floor up. I need your help so that I can no longer walk out of you, but be in you so that my family will grow in you. Casting all your care upon him. For he careth for you. Be sober, be vigilant, because your adversary, the devil, as a roaring lion, walketh about, seeking whom he may devour, whom you resist steadfast in the faith. Remember when Christ prayed for Peter? That his faith fail not. This is how you resist the devil. Steadfast in the faith, knowing that the same afflictions are accomplished in your brethren that are also in the world. Do not stay down. Do not stay stuck. Do not stay depressed. Thinking that you're of no value or worthy. Or where you're or that you're even counted on anymore in Christ. Get up. Like Paul. Get up like Peter. And continue to run the race set before you with patience in Christ. Why? Because we win. Father, thank you for this word. Thank you for this opportunity. Thank you for your grace. Thank you, Lord God, for stepping all over my toes. Thank you, Lord God, that our hearts, I pray, is prepared to receive what the Spirit is saying so that we begin to move in a direction that is in Christ and not of this world. Thank you, Lord, that you have given us a mirror that we can look and see what manner of men or women we are of God so that you may be able to then pluck those things out as we freely give them unto you. Yield it to your spirit so that we may have established promises actively being used and utilized here in our lives and passed down to our generations. To those young people that we may have shunned and not unawares even. That the love of God is shed abroad in our hearts and help to draw them out of the darkness that they're living in, in this world of cancellation and pride and releasing your grace upon them all that your love may envelop them. And once they taste and see that you are good, they'll never look elsewhere for they'll know that the only life worth living is in you. We bless you for the young people that have come, that are here, that are watching. We pray right now that God will give them an unction and that they receive it willingly and allow God by his spirit to walk his life through them all the days of their lives. I pray restoration over every heart. I pray repentance also, Father, that we be stirred 
to allow you to do your work on our hearts, that we desire you to do that work. Only you know the heart. We bless you, Lord. We give you all the glory and praise in Jesus' name. Amen. Getting ready to take communion. I hope I didn't keep you too long.